Well, an alarm is, uh, is designed to wake you up. It's designed to remind you of things. It's designed to warn of approaching danger. And most of us use alarms every day. In fact, I would venture to say that probably most of us use an alarm to get out of bed this morning, right? Or perhaps you used an alarm uh, on your microwave that told you when whatever you were heating was heated. A little buzzer went off, an alarm went off. Um, perhaps uh, you put an alarm on your phone for a certain event on your calendar that's coming up to remind you that that particular thing is coming up. Some of us have smoke detector alarms in our homes. Hopefully you do. Um, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't happen much, but if you go to Honolulu or you go to the mainland and you go to a big parking lot, sometime during the day you'll probably hear somebody's car alarm go off. And most of the time they're not anywhere near the car alarm. They're somewhere inside where they can't even hear it to do anything about it. So it just ends up being a big annoyance to everybody around. See, because the reality is all of those alarms do no good unless we can heed the alarm, right? And sometimes, sometimes we choose, even though we hear the alarm, to not heed the alarm. When I was in college, I had this alarm clock. Some of you remember what an alarm clock was. And it had a snooze button on the top of it. You remember those days? And when that alarm went off, I knew where the clock was. I didn't even have to look at it. And I just reached over and I smacked that snooze button. And it was very effective for ignoring the heed of the alarm. The problem is I missed class a few times because of it. So I had to take the alarm clock and put it across the room so I was forced to get out of bed. And by that time, I was out of bed, so I figured I might as well get up. So I had to do something in order for, for me to heed the alarm. Uh, alarms are there to get our attention. They're there to warn us. They're there to tell us something. But they are of no value unless we heed the call, so to speak. So today, as we continue our exploration of Revelation, we're coming to what is referred to as the seven trumpet judgments. A couple of weeks ago, we, we looked at the first wave of judgments that are going to come on the earth during a period called, in the Bible, the tribulation. And that first wave of judgments is known as the seven seal judgments. They come as a result of Jesus breaking the seals off of a scroll that he has taken out of literally God's hand and with each one of these seals on this scroll comes these judgments. Now this scroll represents, we said, the title deed to the universe. It, it's got written on it the earth and the universe's past and the future. And what's particularly revealed in these breaking of the seals is these future judgments that are coming during this time of tribulation. We saw false peace, murder, war, famine, earthquake, disease, atmospheric and cosmic upheaval, all portrayed in the six judgments that we've seen so far. Intense stuff. In fact, it's so intense that at the end of chapter 6, John hears those who are living at that time going through this experience of these judgments ask who is able to survive. And last week, we, we got a little break from all the judgment, right? We took a little pause. We called it an intermission because, because John gets to see the answer to that question, who can survive? And in chapter 7, we walked into this scene that John talks about, and, and he describes two groups that survive this judgment. One is a group of 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel, that are specifically earmarked to be testifiers of God and of Jesus during this tribulation period, during this judgment period. They are marked in such a way that 
they can't be hurt during this time. They, they don't experience the, the effects of these judgments. And then we saw another group of people, and this was, a, this was an innumerable multitude of Gentiles that lose their lives as a result of persecution and martyrdom during this time. And, and, and these folks are standing before the throne, and we get, again, this picture of an amazing time of worship where, where these folks are standing before the throne dressed in white, and then all the angelic beings are there with them, and these other folks that we've seen in our studies so far, these 24 elders, these four living creatures, and this, just this multitude of people in worship before God. And so we get this little break from all the judgment that's going on and get this massive worship service going on in heaven. And we read this in in chapter 7, verse 9. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes. They held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne and their, on their faces to the ground and worshiped God. And they sang, Amen, which means that is true. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. So this amazing time of worship is what we had a chance to experience and see last week. But now we come to chapter 8, and the intermission comes to an end, and the intensity ramps up as the seventh seal is broken, which releases the next wave of judgments known as the seven trumpet judgments. And with each of these trumpets, when each one is blown, there is a new judgment unleashed, similar to the breaking of the seals. Each trumpet blast serves as an announcement of a new judgment, but it also serves as an alarm that if it's heated, will bring repentance and restoration. So as we go through this this morning, I want you to see these not just as announcements for these judgments that are to come, but also as God's alarm to the people on earth at the time that there's judgment coming, but you can be saved. And so that's what we are going to jump into this morning as we look at this. And and as we get ready to start into chapter 8, we're stepping into kind of this in between time where we've just seen this worship and, and now there's kind of this preparation for what's going to come. And it says in verse 1, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about a half an hour. I saw the seven angels who stand before God and they were given seven trumpets. I've called this sobering silence because Man, in the intermission, the chapter that we looked at last week, there's this amazing scene of worship around the throne. And, and, and I don't know about you, but I found myself almost kind of wanting to join in, you know, because it's just like a, this amazing picture in this scene. And you got to imagine that the, the sound must have been incredible, right? Because John says it's an innumerable number of beings, not just human beings, but heavenly beings in this worship. And it must have just been a, just this amazing sound filling all all of heaven and now the lamb steps up and he breaks the seventh seal and everything goes silent all the worship has stopped all the singing has stopped all the praising has stopped every being in heaven is hushed you go, why? What, what, why would that happen? What, what's going on here? And I think what is happening is the realization that what's coming 
is even more intense than what's already come. The judgments that are about to be poured out on the earth are even more intense than those of the seven seals. And so it brings everyone to this kind of holy hush. And as best as John can calculate, it was, it was like at least a half an hour where there was nothing in heaven. Now you got to stop and think how amazing that is because what we understand of heaven as we go through scripture is that worship is a part of it all the time. And so for all of a sudden to stop, this is truly a sobering silence. And then from there we go into verse 3 and it says, then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. And a great amount of incense was given to him mixed with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascend up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Well, we've already seen this altar. We've already seen the, the prayers as incense. Back in chapter 5, verse 8, uh, John had his first experience in heaven and it says that he saw that when the Lamb took the scroll, verse 8, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. So we've already seen this, and now we see it again, and this is even more intense. And you say, what is this? Well, remember, these are, these are prayers, but up to this point, they're unanswered prayers. But they're about ready to get answered. See, there's this idea that, you know, if I don't get my answer right away when I pray, that somehow God hasn't heard me. And someone once said that there's, there's three possibilities for your prayers as far as God's answer. He either says yes, no, or wait, right? We don't like no, and we really don't like wait, right? We just want it to be yes every time. God, could you just do it? Because I know it will be good. And if you just figured out that it would be good, then we would all be good, right? But the reality is sometimes God says not yet. And we've already seen that too. Because back in, in, in chapter 5, we saw the, sa the saints that are martyred underneath this altar. And they're saying, how long? How long before we get vindicated? So these prayers, these, these prayers that are being poured out, this isn't just, you know, uh, God, pray for auntie and, and pray for uncle and uh, help me as I take my test or, you know, that's not the prayers that are in view here. These are prayers for God to make what's wrong right. These are prayers, if you want to put it this way, that justice would come, right? Have you ever been wronged? And have you ever prayed, God, please help this to be made right? Well, there's going to be a whole lot more wrong that happens in this world and a whole lot more people praying, God, please make it right. And sometimes we don't understand when it doesn't happen when we think that it should. And God, why wouldn't this be good for you to take care of this situation? Why wouldn't it be good for you to bring justice right now? And God's saying, I will. Wait. Wait. There's a time that I will make all things right. This goes back even to Jesus' model prayer that he gave his disciples. Remember what he said, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray for justice, that's what we're praying for. God, will you make earth like heaven is now? God, we know earth is not the way it was meant to be. We know sin has messed it up. We know there's injustice. We know there's, there's pain and sorrow and suffering. God, would you bring your will, what is it, what's it like in heaven, down here on earth? And God's saying, wait, I will, but not yet. But what we see here is this happening. And see, folks, there, there's a picture here of God holding on to our prayers, right? Again, we might think they're bouncing off the ceiling, but there's, there's a beautiful picture here of, of God literally 
holding on to our prayers. It, it reminds me of one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 56, 8. It says this, you keep track of my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. And I love that. Do you understand what he's saying there? Every tear that I've cried, the psalmist said, God, you've taken them as precious and you've kept them in your bottle. You, you know every tear that I've cried. And then not only that, you've recorded that in your book. I know when you've cried about this. I know when you were hurt about this. I know when you lost this. That's the picture, this poetic picture that God hasn't forgot any of our sorrows, any of our prayers. There are just many times that he says, not yet, not yet. And here we see that these prayers for justice are going to be answered. Well, how many prayers are there? Probably millions, right? Verse 5 says, then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar, and he threw it down upon the earth. Thunder crashed and lightning flashed and there was a terrible earthquake. This is kind of a prelude. This is kind of the preparation for these trumpets. The trumpets haven't started blowing yet. But, but with this kind of prelude, this beginning of the answer of unanswered prayers, this picture of lightning and thunder and the rumbling of the earth, once again, this, this earthquake that shakes the whole earth, it's almost as if God is saying, get ready, earth and earth inhabitants. It's coming again. You're going to get it again. Be ready. And when we step into this section where the trumpets start to get blown, the first four I've kind of called the, the universe unhinged because that's what it kind of looks like is happening, that the universe is starting to come unhinged. We see the first trumpet in verse 6. It says, The seven angels with seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blasts. The first angel blew his trumpet. Here's the first alarm. And hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire. One third of the trees were burned. And all the green grass was burned. This first tr trumpet is devastation of vegetation. That's, that's really what's going on. De devastating. See, so what is this hail and fire mixed with blood? Well, we don't know for sure. But remember, we just read about an earthquake. And with a global kind of earthquake, there's going to come uh, volcanic activity. And so it very well could be that that's some of what's going on here, things being spewed into the air. Uh, lava spewing into the air would look like fiery hail falling down. Could be something like that. We don't know for sure because it doesn't say, but whatever it is, it's, it's catastrophic. Imagine what this does to the environment. I mean, you've got one third burning up trees, all of the grass, all the vegetation. Imagine the smoke that's going into the, the atmosphere. Imagine what this does to the food supply. I mean, you've got trees and vegetation that provide fruit and vegetables and that type of thing, a third, gone. You've got lumber, trees that are used for lumber, a third, gone. Just Again, just imagine, this, this is not just about um, uh, uh, what visually is going on here, but how it's affecting everything. Think about all, any kind of animal that grazes and the grass has been burned up. Listen, We've had a picture of that here recently on Molokai. I mean, we're just now starting to really come out of this drought that we were in for several years. You guys remember when all the grass literally was burning up on this island and, and what the grazing animals were doing, they were roaming everywhere looking for something to eat, and they were eating, even eating things that they should have known better not to eat, and it was killing them, right? We were finding deer just dead all over the place. And if we weren't hitting them with our cars, they were dying because they were eating the wrong stuff because there wasn't anything to eat. Now just imagine 
these grazing animals just roaming, looking for something to eat. This is, this is an amazing picture. In verse 8, Then the second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One-third of the water in the sea became blood. One-third of all the things living in the sea died, and one-third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. The second trumpet blows, and we've got another alarm sounding, and it's devastation of the sea. So what is this, this mountain of fire that goes into the sea? Well, it very well could be a meteor, right? I mean, every few years we hear about, oh, you know, there's a chance this meteor is coming, and it, you know, uh, the trajectory might put it in, and, you know, you always hear, you know, either a reporter or a scientist say, well, we got lucky this time. <laughs> it, it could be that. It kills sea life because of whatever foreign substance is in that. Um, and again, if it's, if it's big enough to do that, it's very likely causing a tsunami, which could be the answer for the ships being destroyed, right? So you've got this massive uh, meteor hitting the oceans, causing this massive wave, killing these, uh, all this sea life. It says the sea became blood. Is that literal blood? Could be, or could be that that's the way the pollution coming off whatever this is hitting the ocean is, is pictured here by John. Again, imagine what this does to the world economy. You've got food that comes from the ocean, a third of it gone. It's getting more scarce. You've got ships, many of them that are used to either bring this food out of the ocean or transport goods, a third of them gone. Probably with that, some ports also imagine you've got all this one-third of the sea life dying. Can you imagine the stench in any city close to the shore all over the world? Listen, I, I've had a little taste of this growing up in South Florida. Every once in a while in the Gulf of Mexico, we get something called red tide. And it's an algae that blooms and it, and it kills the fish. And then they wash up on shore and... And sometimes when it's really bad, you can literally smell that for miles. Just, and they have to come and scoop all these fish off and, and go bury them somewhere. Now, imagine that, that's just a, a small part of one state, one coastline. Imagine one-third of all these, and we're talking whales and dolphins and fish and... Verse 10... Then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on one-third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was bitterness. Your, your translation might say wormwood. It made one-third of the water bitter, and many people died from drinking the bitter water. Now, this is the first time the, during the trumpets that we've seen people actually dying. But they're dying now because the third trumpet, the third alarm tells us that the fresh water is going to be devastated. There's devastation of the fresh water. Now, now what is this? Well, it, it says it's a star. How does it, how does it um, contaminate a third of the fresh water? Well, we know as things enter our atmosphere, they break up, right? And so it very well could be as a star is entering the atmosphere, it's breaking up and falling into these places where fresh water is. And remember, this is not just a random chance happening. This is a God-ordained sovereign act. So he's going to make sure it goes where it's supposed to go. Uh, but it's not very difficult to see this type of thing as a possibility. And the fresh water gets polluted by a third. So now, now we've got a third of the vegetation gone, all of the grass gone. We've got a third of the uh, sea polluted and uh, sea animals dead. We've got uh, ships, a third of the ships gone. Now we've got a third of the fresh water. Verse 12, then the fourth angel blew his trumpet and one third of the sun was struck and one third of the moon and one third of the stars and they became dark and one third of the day 
uh, was dark and also one third of the night. This is the fourth trumpet, the fourth alarm, devastation on heavenly lights. You say, well, well, how does the sun and the moon and, and the star, how do they become dark? Well, we know that our sun has an expiration date. Uh, we're told by scientists that it's, you know, eventually going to burn out. Um, they don't know exactly when, but it's a star, and stars burn out. That's what they do. They're big balls of gas and flame, and eventually they burn out. And so if you've got a third of the sun, all of a sudden God's saying, hey, it's time. You're going to start expiring right now. Here's a third of you gone. Well, the moon is, doesn't produce any light on its own. It reflects the sun's light. So it's, if you've got a third of the sun going dark, it's going to affect what's coming off the moon, right? And if the sun is a star that can expire, we know other stars expire and again, a sovereign plan of God saying a third, it's like turn off the switch and they all go off. So now, with everything else going on, with, 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 with the devastation to the plant life, with the devastation to the sea, the incredible stench, the lack of fresh water, now you've got a third of daylight gone. You, you, you've got, uh, probably because of that, mass amounts of crime happening because everybody likes to do the wrong thing when it's dark, right? So, so literally, you've got chaos. Say, so what's the significance of this third? Why does it keep saying a third? Because it shows God's mercy. Because a third, folks, listen, a third could be all. God could just wipe it all out at once. But th remember, these are alarms. Each blast is an alarm. Hey, wake up! Wake up! Judgment is coming. I'm a just God, and I have to judge evil and wickedness, or, or I'm not just. And if I'm unjust, I'm not loving, which means I can't be God. Judgment is coming. Each blast is an alarm. Wake up. It's God's mercy. Could be the whole thing. But he says, no, I'm going to give you a chance. I want you to wake up. These, these first four judgments seem to come in quick succession. We're, we're just given a little bit, and it's kind of like they come in this just bam, bam, bam. So you can imagine, like, you, one comes and you turn around maybe a day or two later, and something else hits, and, and the world is literally reeling and probably calling, you know, conferences and, and heads of state to try to figure out what are we going to do and how are we going to handle this. And again, there's nothing they can do. There's literal chaos going on everywhere. But it's about to get worse. Verse 13 says, Then I looked, and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air. Terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. The, the word literally there is the Old Testament word, woe, which is a, a, a word of of doom. It's a prophetic wor word of judgment. And this eagle is flying over and it's, it's pronouncing three times, which demonstrates the, the intensity of what's about to happen. Terror. Whoa. 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 Because of what's going to be unleashed. And, and that introduces, and again, it's another opportunity for the world to step back and go, well, maybe we should look to this God. And we see a shift on these next trumpets. The, the first four that we just looked at, they, they kind of unleash nature, right? And judgment on nature. They affect the environment, thus affecting people. But these next judgments that we see unleash the demonic world. And they affect directly at people. So that's why under this title I, I just simply put demons deployed because that's what's happening here. Verse 9. 
the fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen to earth from the sky and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And when he opened it, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace and the sunlight and air turned dark from the smoke. So this fifth trumpet simply is legions of locusts come out of this deal. And they come out of this bottomless pit. This, this star, it's called a star, but we know it's not a, a literal star because it's referred to as he and it has a key. So it's more than likely an angel. And it opens up this, what's referred to here as a bottomless pit. In the original, it's the word abyssos, which is where we get our word abyss. It's called the abyss. So it's, this is not hell. This is something different. You say, well, what is it? Well, interestingly enough, we see this word during Jesus' ministry. It, you remember the story where Jesus is in a, a boat. He goes to a, a part of the, the lake of Galilee. He gets out, and he's confronted by a man filled with demons who lives in tombs. You remember that whole deal? And Jesus is casting out the, the demons, and he asks this Demon, what's your name? He says, Legion, because we are many. He's got many demons inside of him. And then it says, it goes on from there in Luke 8, 31. It says, the demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. It's the same word that's used in Revelation. The word that we say, the abyss. So this is not hell. And these demons are, they're begging you, don't send us to this place. It seems to be like a, a prison, almost, for demons. You say, well, what's going on here? Well, real quick, I'm going to give you a, a very fast uh, teaching in angelology. You go, what is that? It's just, what are angels, all right? Just a fancy way to say it. So we're going to break this down real simple for you. Ready? There's two types of angels. There's good angels and bad angels, right? The, the bad angels we call what? Demons, very good. There's two types of demons, according to Scripture. There's demons that are roaming free. They're, they're, they're running around doing it's like, like in this story in, in Luke with Jesus. And then there's demons that have been bound. You say, really? Yeah. Let me, let me show you where we find this. 2 Peter 2, 4. Peter just makes reference to this, and he says this. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned, he threw them into hell. Now, it's translated hell here, but this is not, in the original, this is not the word normally used for hell in the New Testament. This is a word that refers to a, uh, what the Greeks called this pit where demigods were bound and sent, kind of like a prison. That's the word that's used here. And, and, it, and it goes on to say, in gloomy pits of darkness, where they are being held until the day of judgment. In Jude 6, again, we, we get another indication of this. It says, and I remind you, the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. You say, well, what, what, what is going on with these? Well, again, we don't have a whole lot of information. But we do know that before the flood... There was, uh, if you go back to Genesis 6, there was this intense demonic activity going on. So much so that when it was all said and done, the only one that God could find righteous was Noah and his family. So it must have been pretty bad. And so it could be, and we can't say dogmatically, we do know from Jude that whatever this was, they, it says that they went beyond the limits of, the, of their, what God had given them. Remember, Satan and demons can only go as far as God allows them to go. Picture, picture a dog on a leash. Uh, Luther was the one that, that called Satan, uh, the devil, God's devil. And what he meant by that is that Satan can't do anything unless God permits it. 
And we see that in Job. If you go to Job chapter 1, Satan asks God if he can, and God says you can, you can touch him but not kill him. You remember that whole thing? Satan is not the equal opposite of God. You, you need to understand that. Satan is not the, the evil twin of the creator of the universe. He's a created being. And so somewhere in this mix, there are demons that have stepped beyond what God had said. You can go this far and no further. And they went beyond that. And God said, okay, then we're, we're chaining you up now and holding you off till judgment. And it could be that that's what we're seeing here. That these are released. These are really obviously evil, wicked, beyond the norm, if there is such a thing, demon. And they're released in this situation. Verse 3 says, Then the locusts, that's how John's describing them, came from the smoke and descended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. The locusts looked, verse 7, like horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like golden crowns on their head, and their faces looked like human faces. They had hair like women's hair and teeth like the teeth of lions. They wore armor made of iron, and their wings uh, roared like an army of chariots rushing to battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions, and for five months they had the power to torment people. Their king is the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, which means destroyer. So we get this description. John's doing his best. Do you, do you, do you see this? He's using like and as over and over again because he's never encountered any creature like this before. You say, well, it says locust. It's obvious that it's not locust like you and I know locust. This is not, you know, this, this little grasshopper looking thing running around eating plants. It's not what's going on here. These are demon creatures. You go, well, but they seem physical. They are. You say, well, how is that? Well, I don't know, but also remember that, that demons are fallen, what? Angels. And we know that angels show up at times in physical form. So there's obviously that uh, capability and these are just showing up in their hideous form. I mean, when you read over this, this is like out of a horror movie. So they were told not to harm the grass or the plants or the trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Listen, this is so important. We talked about this last week. There's going to be people that are come to Christ during this time period. We know that. We saw two groups of people like that last week in chapter 7. We saw the 144,000 Jews that are specifically saved out to be witnesses for God, and we saw the martyrs around the throne who are killed during that time who have come to Christ probably as the result of the 144,000 who are witnessing during this time. And so all of those folks that come to Christ, they're not going to be affected by this. It's only the people that continue to, to turn their back and deny God. That's what this means. And, and again, these aren't regular locusts because they don't eat grass or plants or trees. They're only zeroed in on people and only people who have rejected God. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain like the pain of a scorpion sting. I have never been stung by a scorpion, but I know there's varying degrees of pain depending on the kind of scorpion you're stung with. And it's one of those things that I've talked to people that have been stung by scorpions and I have no desire to experience that. How bad is it? In those days, people will seek death, but they won't find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The implication there is they're going to try to kill themselves. But they won't even be successful in their, in their suicide attempts. You go, why? Why would God do that? It's another alarm. No, don't kill yourself. Turn to me. If you kill yourself, you don't have me for eternity. But I'm trying to get you to wake up. Turn to me. sixth trumpet 
is in verse 13. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the golden altar that stands in the presence of God. This is where we've just seen the incense a little bit before. And the voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. What we're going to see in this, the sixth trumpet, the sixth alarm, is what I'm describing as troops of terror. They're, go, they're described in verse 15. The four angels who had been prepared for this hour, day, month, and year were turned loose to kill one-third of all the people on the earth. Now, let's pause here for a minute. What are these four angels, what's going on? Don't know, but they've been prepared for this time. I mean, look how specific this is. Prepared for this hour, day, month, year. You don't think God's sovereign? <laughs> That's about as sovereign as you get right there, right? Verse 16. I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. This is, these are, again, these are demons being released. And in my vision, I saw the horses and the riders sitting on them. The riders wore armor that was fiery red and dark blue and yellow, and the horses had heads like lions and fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. Again, John is he's seeing all these, trying to describe it. This is just, it's, so, it's such a bizarre scene for him. He's never seen anything like it. He's doing his best to just try to put it out there, and this is what he sees. Again, this de demonic hordes. These are different. These, these aren't, you know, filling the air like these demonic locust-type things are. Verse 18, one-third of all the people on the earth were killed by these three plagues, by the fire, the smoke, the burning sulfur that came from their mouth, the mouths of the horses. Their power was in their mouths and in their tails so they could kill from front and from back for their tails had the heads of snakes and the power was to injure people. You say, what on earth is going on here? It's demonic. It's, it's, absolute, it's, it's the unleashing of these demonic hordes in, in different ways. This is demonic, some kind of demonic activity going on. And it's, and it's literally killing people. A third of the people. We've already seen in the first set of judgments a quarter of humanity killed. Now there's another third. This is intense stuff, folks. In 2010, a bunch of us um, went to Haiti. It was right after the most devastating earthquake in their history. Over 200,000 Haitians, as best they could calculate, died in that earthquake. We arrived five or six weeks after the earthquake. And the stench of death was still in the air. They literally, there were so many people, they, they showed us, uh, while we were there, they showed us outside of Port-au-Prince where they literally just took earth-moving machines, made these massive holes, and just threw Thousands of bodies, unmarked, nobody identi could identify them. Tens of thousands of people buried like that. Now you can imagine a situation like this where you've got all this death, all this dying, how absolutely overwhelming to take care of all these masses of dead people. I mean, picture, picture back just a couple of years ago during COVID, scenes that we were seeing in places like New York City and Italy where these people were in the hospital and they were just overwhelmed with all these patients. And all. Just imagine this, but, but morgues trying to figure out what are we going to do with all these people? And, and you've already got people scrambling around to try to find water because a third of the water has been contaminated. You've got dead uh, sea life floating, trying to figure out what are we going to do with that? You, you've got... Uh, less sunlight going on because of a third of the heavenly lights have been put out. This is absolutely horrific stuff going on here. This is... You, you can't make a movie like this.
Now you understand maybe why it was silent in heaven for 30 minutes before all this starts. Verse 20. To me, this is the most frightening and sad part of this whole chapter. But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to repent of their evil and turn to God. They continue to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols that can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murderers their witchcraft, their sexual immorality, their thefts. By the way, that word witchcraft there is the word in the original where we get our word pharmacy. Um, potions. It would be what we would talk about today as drug abuse. So we see all this stuff going on today, right? Oh, and, and sexual immorality there is the word we get our word pornography. It's the word pornea in the Greek. It means any kind of sexual deviance that you can think of. It, it, it just all is collected in that, that word. And all this stuff we see happening today, right? Murders, drugs, sexual anything, thefts. But, but this is going to be on a scale never seen before. Because who's, who's policing anything at this point? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, that's what's going on in Haiti right now. I, I keep referring back to Haiti because it's kind of fresh in my mind. Just a, please pray for the people of Haiti. It's so bad there right now. But, but part of the problem is gangs are just running rampant. There's, there's little to no police available. And so what happens when you don't have any kind of boundaries, then the worst of the worst rise to the top and just start running havoc all over the place. And that's what we're going to see happening during this time. But all of these natural disasters, they pour out on the world, and all these demonic hordes are let loose, and stuff happening that's never been experienced in the world before, and all this, all this death, and all this sorrow, and all this suffering, and all this pain, and everything is happening. And it's God's way of saying, turn to me. I am the one doing this, and I will save you if you repent. And they refuse. They would rather have their, their idols that can do nothing thing. They would rather live the lifestyle they've been living and live in the horror that they have than to turn to God. It's it's absolutely mind-boggling to me, the refusal to repent. And yet, there's a part of me that can believe. Because how many people have I seen over the years steeped in a lifestyle, living in a way that's just absolutely destroying their life and extending to them, listen, it doesn't have to be this way. God has a better plan for you. God loves you. Christ died for you. He has best for you. And yet, in the misery and in the brokenness, they continue to refuse God's offer of salvation and cling to their suffering and their brokenness. And you know people like that too. And you walk away and you go, how is, why, why, why wouldn't you turn to God? And we see this just kind of in a ramped up way here. And we're left at the end of this with all these trumpets, all these blasts, all these alarms. God's saying over and over again, listen, I'm I'm, I'm giving you a chance. I want you to repent. And they refuse to. And we're left at the end of this just kind of going, man, we need another intermission. (laughs) Amen? Say, Rand, what can we learn from this? Give me something. Give me some hope here, (laughs) Rand. Okay, here we go. What's the message for the church? Well, there, there are many, many in here, but I'm going to give you three real quick. Here's the first one. Demons are real, and they're committed to your destruction. See, we cruise around life right now, especially in the Western world, and we, di- you know, we talk about demons because we've seen a lot of movies, right? We've seen Stephen King. 
And we know what uh, demons are all about because we've seen the movies. And so in the back of our minds, we go, eh, I don't know, right? Listen, <laughs> the reality is not only what you can touch, see, and feel. It's the spiritual world as well, right? And we don't have any problem clinging to the reality of a God who is spirit, right? Well, yeah, well, I know. We, but we don't want to think about the reality of demons. And the reality is, folks, they're very real and they're committed to your destruction. Go well. Oh, can I be possessed by a demon? If you've trusted Christ in your savior, as your Savior and the Holy Spirit resides in you, I don't believe you can be based on what my understanding of Scripture. The Bible says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. But they can certainly affect you. They can, what we call, oppress you. Remember what... At the end of each church that we looked at in the first three chapters, you, you remember what Jesus said to the churches? He that has an ear to hear what? Listen, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Well, how do we do that? He's talking about a spiritual ear in tune with the Holy Spirit. Now, if I can have a spiritual ear in tune with the Holy Spirit, I can have an ear that's affected by an evil spirit. As an evil spirit speaks lies into my spiritual ear, I can follow that instead of following the Holy Spirit. That's how you can be affected by demonic activity. Demons are real, and, and we see, part of what we see in Revelation is the, is the revealing of Jesus Christ and all his glory as we continue to go through, but we also see this epic battle, spiritual battle that's taking place in the unseen world, now seen, now brought out into the open. All the ugliness and all the terror and all the stuff that goes along with it. And so when we have something like that just took place this past week in Boston, uh, maybe you saw it, called SatanCon. It was billed as the biggest gathering of Satan worshipers ever in the history of the world. And what they tried to say when they interviewed the, the guy that was in charge of it, is, well, you know, we don't, you know, it's not like we really worship Satan, the whole idea is that we're kind of like anti-authority. Well, the reality is, folks, the very first thing that they did, and go check this out, the very first thing that they did in their opening session is they took a Bible and they tore it apart. You go, well, I mean, don't you think that's just kind of like, you know, they're, they're just being dramatic? And I don't care what it is. You don't mess with the demonic world. Right? Because it's very real. Here's number two. This is where we start getting some more hope. Satan's schemes and people's sins will never hinder God's plan. That's a hallelujah for sure. No matter what Satan devises and no matter what, how bad the sin gets, folks, and it's getting bad. The, the sin that people are doing and the stuff that's happening, it's not random anymore. It's almost daily. We see it over and over and over again. It's escalating and it'll get worse. But you've got to be reminded that God has a plan that won't be hindered. He's still on the throne, right? And that's what we're focusing as we go through this book. No matter all the horror and all the judgment and all the stuff that we're seeing, we've got to remember he is on the throne. And his plan will go forward. And you've got to remind yourself of that. Especially in the days that we live in. Especially if you're a news junkie. Be careful. Because you can get discouraged and depressed really quick. If, if you are not balancing what you're seeing in the news with God's word and his truth, you're going to very easily find yourself in a foul mood most of the time. Scared, depressed, discouraged. Okay, Be careful. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen? And so we, of all people, should not walk around in fear. Because we know who's sitting on the throne. And we know that no scheme of Satan and no sin of people will ever hinder God's plan. 
That's why when we come together, man, I would love to see more of us early in the service coming together to sing together. There, there is something about our, and, and I'm seeing this more and more as we're going through Revelation too, as these gatherings, we get these glimpses of gatherings of heaven where there's singing and worship going on and there's, there's something empowering about that. I mean, even as we sang this morning, John and I were talking afterwards, almost just like a washing over and yes, this God is all that. And, there, and there's something that takes place when we worship together. And we're reminded of who's in charge and who's on the throne and, and his plan won't be hindered. The last thing is this. Repentance leads to restoration. Heed the alarms. Folks, we're seeing the alarms specifically during this time of tribulation, these trumpets, these, these alarms that God is blowing and saying, listen, this is an opportunity for you to repent, re return. But, but uh, the reality is alarms are going off all the time around us. What we're seeing in our world right now is as things ramp up and get worse and worse and more evil and more evil, these are a type of alarm to get us to where we need to be. If, you've, if you're a follower of Christ and you have been straying in your commitment to him, these are alarms to say, hey, hey, stop hitting the snooze button. Let's get up and get busy. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ, it's an alarm for you to run to him. He's waiting for you. He's not going to force you, but he will bring these things in your life that cause you to go, whoa, what is going on? And what's going on is he's calling you to himself. He's calling you to repentance, and with that repentance will come restoration. Heed the alarm. Amen? Father, we come before you this morning, and as we read this stuff, Lord, it is just, it's just overwhelming. We can't really fathom it. We, we read it, and it's as if, it's as if there's just, there's no way. It's just too massive. It's just too intense. And yet, Lord, the more we see and the more we've experienced, especially in the last decade or so, it seems to be more and more possible. And Lord, I hope us as we look at these things to be reminded that in the midst of all these things is your mercy. The third could have been all. And in your mercy, you're continuing to reach out and call to repentance those who've turned their back on you. I don't know who you want to pull to yourself, Lord, only you know that. And I pray if there's someone in here this morning that's never come to that point where they have heeded the alarm of salvation, that they would, they would do that today. Man, if that's you, listen, Jesus died for you. He took God's judgment. That, that, that's what the cross is all about. He took God's wrath on himself for you. But, but the only way that's effective, just like any payment that's made, it's got to be accepted. You, you have to accept that. You have to believe that Jesus is who he said he was and what he did on the cross was for you. And again, Scripture is very clear, for God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And if that's you this morning, if you're looking at this going, man, this is awful, this is, this is so scary. Yeah, it is, it is. It's, it's God's judgment on an evil world that has to be if he's, if he's going to be a just God. But you, 
you don't have to experience God's wrath in that way because Jesus has already taken it for you if you'll place your faith and trust in him. Scripture says, call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Yes, God, I believe that you sent Jesus for me. I believe that his death on the cross took the judgment that I should have. He took it for me. I believe that. I believe that he rose again from the dead to prove that everything he said and did was true. I believe that, God. Call on him today. Heed that alarm. Christian, there's alarms going off all around us that this world is quickly headed for a time of judgment. There are people all around us that need to know that God loves them. Jesus died for them. Man, what are we doing? How are we living? Do your kids know? Do your grandkids know? Man, let's... Let's get that message of truth and hope to as many people as we can. Lord, I pray that you would take your word this morning and stir our hearts, not just our imaginations. And I pray, Lord, that we would understand that that putting our faith and trust in you isn't just about missing judgment. It's about clinging to the best you All of our hopes and our our dreams and our desires and our delights and our affections are all anchored in you. And, And when we come to you, we get all of that. We get you. So I pray that no one would go out of here this morning thinking this is just about avoiding judgment. This is about that treasure in the field that Jesus talked about that, that when the man found it, he sold everything because he wanted the best. So God, I pray that you would just continue to work in our hearts as we go through this unfolding, unveiling of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be stirred to worship deeper, to speak bolder, to live cleaner, in light of your coming. May may this, Lord, just, just reflect well what you intend as we go through it together. May you be exalted in all that we do, Lord, in your name. Amen.